uh, you know, Jack was happy and it was uh, nice enough to invite me to do that. But I think it's because he knows how much I feel, how much passion I have for this area. And I'm hoping to share some of that with you today. It's, it's particularly fortuitous that we're doing it this week because the actually International Antarctic Day was uh, actually two days ago, December 1st. And uh, so uh, it's, the, it's the day of celebration of that part of the world and, and the appreciation we all should have for that. Um, this is also the 200th year of the discovery of the continents of Antarctica. So, it, you know, I, I want to start the presentation a little bit by sharing some of the exploration and the history and some of the geography of it, just to kind of put it all in context for you, uh, because I think that you can't go there just as a diver. You need to go there uh, with the idea that you are truly a polar explorer and that you're going to have an obligation when you come home you know, to share some of that history and knowledge and, and passion for this part of the world when you get back. So, uh, so let me start by sharing uh, first with you some geography uh, and about where you go, you're talking. So Antarctica is the southern continent. Obviously, we know it's at the, the quote, the bottom of the South Pole. And uh, most people get there from the tip of South America, uh, leaving from a town called Ushuaia and crossing the Drake Passage, which is the uh, notoriously the roughest uh, stretch of water in the world, to get over to the Antarctic Peninsula. And that is the most common uh, area that you're talking about, that people, that people actually get to visit. There are science stations that are throughout the continent, uh, in some, the most famous of which is McMurdo. That's the US science station. It's the largest one down there. Uh, and that is on the Ross Ice Shelf. And, uh, but that could only be gotten there by, uh, you know, really by plane effectively. Uh, they fly there from uh, New Zealand. Uh, and there are a uh, lot well, of the scientists that fly there from the, the other side, from New Zealand and Tasmania uh, to get there. Uh, but most of the tourists, so to speak, uh, were gonna come, are gonna come from South America and cross that Drake Passage. And uh, you're gonna enter Antarctica politically when you cross that 60 degree parallel. That 60 degree uh, parallel means you're actually in the in Antarctica, uh, uh, even though you might be technically not hitting the continent yet. But it, from a scientific standpoint, if you, you're actually hitting the Southern Ocean when and, the, and therefore all the waters that are around Antarctica uh, that are typical for Antarctica are when you cross that squiggly line. That is the border between the Southern Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic, and the Indian Ocean. And it is an amazing difference when you cross that line. And it really does seem like a line because literally you're going to cross that line, uh, you know, in about the space of a couple of miles. And the water temperature will go uh, from about uh, 50, de 50 degrees uh, or about uh, 10 degrees Celsius uh, down to about 4 degrees Celsius. Uh, or about 38 degrees uh, in the space of uh, about two miles. And uh, all of a sudden the water is different. Uh, so this continent, it was a long time that people thought that actually this continent was actually kind of sort of attached to South America and Africa. Uh, in the, they didn't really understand that. It was actually uh, James Cook, who was actually the first, uh, this is a, a, a image, a, a, a painting of his ship. He was actually the first one to go across the polar circle in 1773, though he never did lay eyes on the continent. And uh, he was the one who therefore uh, actually confirmed that the Southern continent really wasn't a part of anything else, uh, but was actually separated from all, by all the other oceans, uh, major oceans on the planet and, and was actually its own entity. Uh, he did figure that out. It wasn't until 1820 uh, uh, that Russians actually discovered uh, the continent itself. And this was actually an image, this was actually a uh, painting from the James Ross expedition, which happened in 1839 to 1843. And where he actually explored much of going, much of the continent, going around the continent and actually sending expeditions uh, into the heart of the continent. He was the one who discovered the Ross Ice Shelf, hence the name Ross Ice Shelf, um, as well as naming Mount Erebus and Mount Terror, the two largest uh, and most active volcanoes uh, on the on Antarctica after his ships, uh, Erebus and Terror. Ironically, both of those ships would be lost a few years later in the Arctic during the famous or infamous, uh, shall I say, Franklin expedition up in Canada. Uh, so the, one of the most famous explorers of the Antarctic 
is without a doubt Ernest Shackleton. Uh, most people have heard of him, even if you're not much of an Antarctic history buff. And, uh, and, and ironically, he was most famous for his failure. And uh, that's because in 1914, he led an expedition trying to cross trans, the, uh, trying to cross the entire continent of Antarctica, uh, and in which unfortunately ended uh, in significant and major failure. And we'll talk about that in a sec. Uh, but this is the ad he ran for his men to get the men for the ship uh, for the voyage. Men wanted for hazardous journeys, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful honor and recognition in case of success. So, I mean, that is a really, uh, you know, way to sell something, right, Ernest Shackleton. But uh, he got thousands of people wanting to join him because this was the heroic age of polar exploration. And it was quite the time for this, you know, uh, Antarctica was where everybody wanted to go. Uh, this was the exciting, uh, you know, an exciting uh, place. And the honor and recognition part of it was real. Uh, people were excited by that. He had an incredible crew. Uh, you know, there were his right-hand man, Frank Wild. Uh, Frank Curley was actually the uh, photographer of the expedition. It was one of the most well-documented expeditions. Uh, and there were 21 men uh, total uh, who were on the ship of the Endurance. Unfortunately, the uh, expedition met almost immediate failure or immediate challenges, I should say. Uh, the, uh, they were frozen in the ice. Uh, very early on uh, in the Weddell Sea in, eight, in 1915, uh, and despite their best efforts, uh, the ship was surrounded by the ice and eventually crushed. Uh, so at that point, they had to abandon the, uh, the ship, and actually they ended up in Elephant Island, uh, which is an extremely barren a uh, difficult place to, to leave people, unfortunately. Uh, you'll see some images of that shortly. Uh, and in an effort to try, knowing that they could not survive there till the following year, or concerned they would not be able to survive there until the following year, uh, the uh, Shackleton and three others actually took off in a rowboat, uh, literally a rowboat uh, with a sail, uh, the makeshift sail, crossed the Drake Passage to get to South Georgia, which is the uh, major, which was a major island at that point that was the station for a lot of the whaling uh, uh, that was going on in the Southern Ocean. And, uh, and they got there and, uh, and uh, it, amazingly in one piece an incredible feat of navigation and, and, and strength of will and uh, actually managed to get back with a rescue party uh, sometime later to get to, uh, to everybody and rescue everybody in Elephant Island. It was truly uh, an incredible feat of leadership. Actually, you didn't lose anybody uh, from the endurance. Uh, and it, it was just an incredible uh, story. And anybody who, you know, still a, wants to read about that leadership and, the, and what he did to make that happen, it, it's definitely a great, great story. He actually went back to Antarctica, uh, excuse me, he tried to go back to Antarctica in uh, 2022, in uh, 2021, 2022. And he actually, unfortunately, uh, didn't make it. He, was, uh, he wanted to have one last big Antarctic expedition uh, there. And uh, unfortunately, he, he died in January uh, 1922 and did not um, uh, reach his goal of crossing Antarctica as he had hoped. Um, but he is buried in South Georgia. He's buried uh, actually facing the south, uh, facing his beloved Antarctica, uh, as, as his wife asked. And uh, one of the greatest things about going to South Georgia and going to um, uh, Griffith in the, the town that he is, the little uh, village area that he's buried in, is uh, being able to see his grave. And uh, so I wanted to uh, show you that right here. You all know the famous quotation from the veteran Antarctic explorer Raymond Priestley, who said, for speed and efficiency of travel, give me Amundsen. For scientific discovery, give me Scott. But when all hope is lost, get down on your knees and pray for Shackleton. <laughs> So it's wonderful that we can get the chance to come here to add our thoughts to an amazing life. And one final thought, Shackleton, he was a charismatic character. He loved a good party. And above all, he wanted fame. He wanted his name to be remembered in a, in a happy way. And he would be overjoyed to know that a hundred years later, 
people were coming from all over the world to gather at his great site to talk about him, to raise a glass of whiskey to him, and to toast to Shackleton. He would love that. So I invite you all now to raise your glass and give a toast to, Ernest. as his men called him, the boss, Ernest Shackleton. Ernest, Ernest Shackleton. Ernest Shackleton. Well, I want to add that uh, you, might have, you might notice in this picture that we all took of our group uh, around his grave site after, afterwards. You might notice there are some blurry eyes. That's because I think all 32 of us bought, uh, brought a bottle of whiskey. Uh, to the grave site, and uh, and you know you can't you know not you know not share it with the boss. So you know we uh, it, it was quite a early uh, early morning um, of uh, to be drinking, but you know what can you do? It's uh, when in Griffith, and it's what you have to do. Uh, so when you go to South Georgia, and actually when you go to Antarctica in general, there's a huge amount of history of whaling in that area, and it's one of the things that you see a lot of the remnants of that. And it's hard to see sometimes, but it is a very important part of the history. And uh, South Georgia in particular, because many of the communities there, the, the, well, they used to be communities, are, still have the remnants of the whaling ships there from when the whaling was ended in the 60s. You know, there's plenty of seals though, face, you know, coming to visit you when you, when you come to the, uh, come on land. See here's a, the remnants of a whale skull. And whaling ships is actually a shipwreck, uh, not in South Georgia, in Antarctica itself, uh, but you know a remnant. Uh, it's a whaling factory ship that burned down that you can dive on. It was pretty amazing. And then seeing those bones underwater. So it's so if you make this trip, it's not necessarily just diving in Antarctica. You're diving other places besides that. That is, yeah, depending on the trip. I mean, most of the trips go down to what we call the peninsula, okay, what's called the peninsula, and that's just Antarctica itself. Uh, we also do a number of trips that add in the outlying islands as well, and uh, that's really pretty exciting, you know, because it's quite, there's a lot, a lot of diversity with that, uh, but they're much longer, so it's all a matter, and of course, that raises the price, so you have to take a look at that as well. Uh, but what's really nice about seeing all this is you see this underwater, you see this piece of history, you see this maybe piece of not so good of his part of our history, you know, when we were slaughtering uh, so many whales. But at the same time, you then go up and you come to the surface and, and when you're on the surface, you're very likely to come in contact with many whales. Um, we were on one, one trip we were on in 2016, we actually had about 150 humpback whales surround our ship to the point where we couldn't move the ship for about three or four hours because they were so close. And they were literally, the spray from the blowhole was get, was landing on people. It was that, they were that close. It was pretty incredible. So the whales have come back, that's the good news. It's amazing what happens when you stop hunting them. And as well as other cetaceans that are very common to see during that Drake Passage crossings or other crossings, uh, such as these uh, dusky dolphins The orcas, this was actually a group of about 600 orcas that uh, we saw uh, on our way back from Antarctica back to Ushuaia. So it's pretty incredible to see this just from the surface. So it keeps those pet, those crossings uh, from being a little bit too, a uh, little bit crazy, or a little bit uh, stir crazy in two days crossing the ocean. One of the things that will also keep us company while we do those long crossings are the albatrosses. So this is a, a colony of albatrosses in the Falkland Islands. Uh, obviously, uh, the chicks here, uh, and the albatrosses are pretty incredible. And uh, the it, just to watch them, they can literally fly. Uh, or I should say glide for up to a hundred miles on a single flap of their wings. Wow. I, I mean, it's just an amazing feat. So one person asked um, on their trip in 2022 when they're going, are you going to go visit that wreck? Is that part of that trip? Um, the wreck, I don't know. Um, I hope so because, but if not that wreck, there's actually another one I want to do. <laughs> and uh, so they can message me if they have some questions about that. But there's another wreck that I would like to do actually um, that's uh, a little bit more uh, recent. And uh, so we'll, we'll, I can, uh, I can uh, talk with them a little bit about that off record, but it's a, uh, it, there's a wreck that's a little bit closer to the Palmer Science Station. And I, and I think that's going to be right on our path of when we go down to the polar circle. So that's on the agenda. 
So uh, are these wrecks like in still like really good shape because of the coldness of the water? It, it, Is depends. That... it depends. I mean, you know, you, you saw kind of what that one looked like. It's uh, it's very close to the shoreline, the one, the, the one I showed you there, because um, it's actually you know, partially above water. So it gets in it and it's in a bad spot for the ice. So it doesn't get a lot of life growing on it because it gets the ice scrapes it clean pretty much every year. But uh, the other one has a lot more life on it. Uh, but yeah, they're in pretty good shape, especially because you know how old it is. That wreck is, uh, you know, that wreck that you showed that that's in the from the 30s, uh, from 1930s. Wow. Yeah, so it, they're in pretty good shape. These are actually the rock hopper penguins that actually come up the um, uh, come up the cliff with the uh, with um, on the, in the Falkland Islands. This cliff's about 800 feet high. Uh, and uh, they come up and go up and down that cliff like it's nothing. It's pretty crazy. In South so, Georgia, they have uh, several very large colonies of, of penguins that we would spend some time with. This is actually uh, one of the places. This one is um, uh, my favorite spot, actually. And you see there uh, a whole bunch of stuff going on in the shallows. And, and that's actually an important thing to take notice of because a lot of what happens when we're in the water with animals happens in five feet of water, okay? And it's because that's where a lot of the interactions are with the penguins and the seals and, and that's where they're playing, the juveniles are playing. And so that's where a lot of the fun is. And it, so it's great actually just snorkeling or just standing in the water, you know, seeing what might happen. And you're gonna see some shots about, you know, uh, to demonstrate that in a moment. You can see this is a really easy way. You're, you're getting in the Zodiacs and you, uh, from the ship and the ship, the Zodiacs bring you to shore. Uh, they're usually pretty much all wet landings, you know, meaning so you have to have your, you know, kind of your feet are gonna get wet. Uh, but you have these uh, wet, um, muck boots on that prevent you from uh, getting freezing cold from that. And so most some of the landings are really calm like that and really great. And you really hope for those kind of landings. Uh, and in this particular spot, this is called Salisbury Plain, we were going to, to particularly see the king penguins. So those are about two feet high. Uh, and so not as big as the emperor penguins uh, get, but they're similarly uh, colored and, and equally beautiful. And there's huge colonies of them there. Uh, you can see these two were kind of channeling their inner penguin. <laughs> and, uh, and this is actually where the main colony is. So this is 250,000 mating pairs of, them, of king penguins. Yes, that's half a million king penguins. And yes, those dots are all what you think they are, another penguin. Wow. And yeah, it doesn't get much better than that. I mean, it's just, just seeing it is just incredible. Um, and it's just mind blowing experience to see it and to hear it, man, they're live, let me tell you. So when you're doing these things, what's the, like, is that, obviously this is during the summer of Antarctica, but um, what are the air and water temps usually still? Uh, well, the air temperatures usually, um, well, unfortunately now it's, <laughs> I guess that depends on, on, on uh, how, how, like for example, our last trip, we got up to 55 degrees and on the air. And that's not good, okay? I mean, it felt right. really nice to walk around in a t-shirt, but it's not normal, okay? Uh, but normal temperatures are around 35, uh, it probably, you, you know, either just a little bit above freezing, say, you know, 30, you know, say 35 to 40 um, and in a good day, you know? Uh, the biggest issue is the wind chill, actually, less the actual air temperature. Um, and the water temperature, uh, if you're lucky, it hits freezing. Um, in, in South Georgia, it'll be a little bit warmer, uh, maybe 36, um, so a little bit above, uh, above freezing. Uh, but usually uh, you're in the 29 to 30 range, so slightly below or negative one C. So for me, that's just like growing up in Minnesota. Uh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But these king penguins are absolutely beautiful. And, uh, but not all the places are that easy to get to. So, uh, so this was actually the most challenging place we've ever bought, gone, a part of Antarctica we've ever gone to. And this is actually the South Sandwich Islands. And we were the first ones to uh, dive in the South Sandwich Islands in 2016. We're actually still the only ones to have dove in, in um, the South Sandwich Islands. Uh, so pretty proud of that. Um, and uh, we were, when we landed with our boat, with our boatload of people, uh, we practically doubled the number of people that had ever set foot on the South Sandwich Islands. 
So that was pretty amazing, uh, you know, feat for us. But we worked it, worked for it, as you can see. It was pretty rough that day. Uh, getting into shore was not was, uh, you know, a little bit challenging. And uh, but you can see the penguins didn't have any trouble. Funny how that works. And this is what the landscape that we saw very stark. It's a volcanic island, so it's all volcanic uh, sand. And uh, but the penguins, the they have one million chin strap penguins on this one island and a lot of seals as well. Uh, a few macaroni penguins are mixed in. I like their hair. Benzos. And of course, we like going at that time of year. We go we go generally in uh, you know February into mid-March. Um, and that primary reason for going then is because the chicks are being are very active then, the parents are feeding them, the parents are teaching them how to swim. Uh, there's a lot of, and hunt, and you know, so there's a lot of uh, activity going on. And the chinstrap penguin babies are my favorites, I think. They are just the cutest. <laughs> so it's pretty fun to watch them, you know, interact, you know, hang out in the surf zone and, and watch them move and, and uh, how they teach their, their uh, kids or their chicks to swim. They do a so, much better job than we do. So is this where you'd see a lot of the interactions with the, the leopard seals going after them? Yes, um, it, we, it was a little too rough for us to hang out, as you saw, you know, in the surf zone that day, because the surf zone was, you know, basically like a bad day at La Jolla Shores. But uh, it, the, um, uh, you know, generally speaking, that is one of the reasons we go during that time frame is because they are teaching the chicks uh, how to hunt and swim and, and be penguins. Uh, the, uh, it does draw in the leopard seals. And yeah, I know that sounds kind of kind of morbid, but we're gonna we're gonna show some images of that shortly. So there's also a lot of fur seals. These are the southern fur seals, and they're quite loud and vocal. Uh, there's actually about one in ten thousand are actually albinos, and I just think they're adorable. Uh, they got some good teeth on it though, right? You know, they got some, but they're all bark. You know, we've never had any issues with them. Uh, actually, we've never had any issues with any of the seals there or sea lions, but it's a, uh, it, they do have some pretty impressive uh, dental structure. It, you know, so as you get into this, the polar lands, there's something about it that's very hard to explain until someone's gone there. And I tell people that and, and everybody's like, oh, well, you know, I've seen the pictures and blah, blah, blah. And then when you get there, you, you realize, oh yeah, I, I didn't get it until I get here. And so this is one of those places that defies description, but the starkness of the landscape, you know, just strikes in, into you and really gets, gets you going. You know, Elephant Island is a really good example of that. Uh, there have been uh, over 200 attempts at landing. And as of about 2018, uh, there were only three uh, uh, groups that actually were successful at getting um, on shore. We were never successful at getting on shore there. We actually tried, but the wind changed and the, um, and the Zodiacs couldn't land there. Uh, but we were able to dive there, you know, which was pretty exciting for us. It's an extremely inhospitable landscape. You can see this is our first encounter with the uh, leopard seals. You can see that one right there that approached our Zodiac, very, you know, friendly and you know, so this is our first encounter with the leopard seals on that particular trip was when we tried to get into Elephant Island. But it is an extremely stark landscape and you start getting your sense of really how forbidding uh, Antarctica can be. It is a black and white landscape, especially at least above water. You know, you have your uh, dark mountains and then the snow and ice covering it. Uh, it is incredibly beautiful, but incredibly stark at the same time. And the, then the only color you have above water is the blue and the icebergs and everything, because there's no vegetation, uh, unlike in the Arctic where you start to see some of that. Now, there is a plenty of, a lot of color underwater. Okay, that's the good news. This plan, and we're about to go there now. But before we go underwater, I wanna talk a little bit about what it takes to go there. And I know that's something that most people are interested in. So what to expect the diving to be like, you know? And my first comment is that this is expedition style diving. So that means when you get the dive briefing in the morning, we're not gonna tell you to go, to go down. When you hit 35 feet, there'll be a rock and there's this grouper that lives under the rock, you know, and you gotta, and you take a right and then, or a 270 degree heading, and then you're gonna get it with this big patch of coral. And yeah, that's not gonna happen, okay? You know, when you, most of the places you're diving, nobody's ever been to. 
if they have been there, nobody's been there for a year and nobody knows what the ice did in the year. It is a very, very different kind of diving. This is true expedition style diving. Uh, and and it's real, that to me is an exciting part of it, but it isn't for everybody, okay? If what you want is someone to guide you in the water and to lead you around and, and make sure you see all the cool stuff and all the best pictures, then that's a great, you know, then this is, that's great, but this is not the type of diving for you, okay? Uh, and, and it isn't just the cold, the cold is part of it, but it's also the situational awareness and the independence that you need to have, you know, to dive in a place like this. But, but let's talk about the cold. After all, DUI is a dry suit company. So let, let's chat about that. The first thing is cold makes everything more complicated. And, the, and it's really challenging because you're getting dressed in a relatively warm area, but not totally you know, enclosed and, and, and toasting. Um, and, and then you have to sit around and, and then you, and you warm up because you're waiting for your turn to get in the Zodiac and you're all enclosed and you're ready to go and, and, you, and you maybe start to overheat even. And then you've got to get in the Zodiac and have that wind blowing on you and then you jump in the water. And the reality of it is, is that we really suck at telling temperatures. You know, we cannot tell absolute temperature. We can only tell differences in temperature. So when you are really warm and you get in really cold water, it feels even worse than it really is. Uh, but if you have already gotten yourself cold and you get in the water and it's cold, you might not even feel it, but you're already lowered your body core temperature. So there's a whole bunch of issues associated with that. And, and so we try to work with everybody to manage their thermal needs uh, appropriately on the trip. And it's one of the things we spend a lot of energy and, and time doing on the boat. Uh, because we're trying to make sure that everybody is at least adequately functional. Uh, and that means their body core temperature never gets below 36 C or 96.8. Uh, there's usually some loss of mental performance or manu uh, manual dexterity at that point, but it's manageable, um, you know, because it's not like we're trying to work underwater, right? You know, and uh, we're actually going there for fun and we can end the dive because we're not working underwater. We can end the dive if we get cold, right? You know, that's the best, that's the whole idea. But you never want to get to that point where you're that barely functional diver because that, that's a scary thing and a, and a very high risk proposition. So how much do you need in order to be a fully functional or adequately functional diver? So the, the measurement here, you see there's a, the top goes across, it says insulation and quo. And quo is basically uh, a, a grading that different undergarments could have and the and, uh, and for example, the 450 from uh, DUI, uh, you know, has a, uh, a flow of about a 1.2, uh, you know, so it's a very high flow. The, uh, the uh, 300 uh, duotherm has about a 0 0.85, 0 0.9, you know, flow. So that gives you an idea as to what you could do for different lengths of time in there. So if you're wearing the uh, power stretch and you're in zero degree water or 32 degree water, uh, then you might have somewhere around 30 minutes uh, bottom time uh, before you you are no longer functional or, or you know or safe in the water uh, or comfortable enough in the water. But if you're wearing the Finsulate, you might be you could be up to 50 minutes in the water. Now this is the average person. Now this doesn't mean that for everybody because there's different individuals who are uh, get colder faster than others. I'm I'm one of them, so I can feel like I can say that. Um, but uh, but you know it gives you a guideline or a place to start uh, for what you need for your insulation. So how do you pick what you need? Um, so the biggest thing is to try to get something that has low conductivity under compression. So things that really are nice and puffy and lofty are great on the surface. And they're gonna keep you really nice and warm when you're getting geared up and all of this, and that's great. Cause you're not gonna you know, have your body core temperature dropping. But when they get smushed between you and a dry suit, they're no longer all that warm, okay? They lose a lot of their insulation. So you want things that have, compression resistance like easy insulate or the power stretch Polotech or the you know the the dual therm you, that's what you you want to start with you preferably for most people it's better if you get something that's effective when wet uh primarily because if it does get wet you know you want to be able to get out of the water safely now if you're diving in with a no decompression profile which you will be in antarctica because they don't allow decompression diving uh, then you could easily just go to the surface, right? If you have a problem and that mitigates some of that. Um, but a hydrophobic material like insulate is preferred for sure. Right, because uh, there's also, cause people have, well, because a lot of people get, um, forget about condensation because your body's constantly um, sweating, evaporating Correct. moisture Correct. into the suit. So yep. 
Yeah, so you need the material that keeps you warm even when it's wet. Yeah, and that and and the good news is you're not theoretically you're not in the in that undergarment long enough to have a huge problem with it because you're only doing two dives a day, you know, and they're usually 45 minute dives at the most, uh, just because people freeze out after that. Um, but it, it, you know, it is it, it, if you can if you can wear thinsulate and you can fit thinsulate, then it's probably the way to go, for sure. Um, I don't have that advantage. I don't have normal shape, <laughs> a standard shape. So, so I layer with th different uh, aspects of polar tech. Uh, but I also know that, hey, you know, if I if I get wet, I just come out. You know, I'm not going to tough it out because I know that it very quickly you can go from, hey, I'm I'm cool, I'm cold, but I'm okay, to I'm cold and I don't I can't help myself get out of water out of the water, and that's an unsafe situation. Uh, so. You want to try to have something fit well because you're trying to minimize how much weight you have to wear, especially since you have to wear a lot of extra stuff. And then, of course, there's the layering using you know maximum of three layers, using maybe a primary and a and a um, something that wicks underneath, and then a and then a vest over that, you know that kind of thing. And then augmenting it with active heating is also you know really helpful as well. Mm -hmm. So all so of these active are heating being electric undergarments. Correct. 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 So, um, so that's something that's all something that, you know, if you go on a trip with us, we work with people, you know, to help them understand that. Um, and we're always able to, you know, always willing to help people figure out what's going to work for them, for sure. Because it is a very individual thing. It really, it, it's a big challenge because it may, you know, personal physiology or gender, your ethnic background, maybe you've had previous thermal injuries, you've gotten frostbite, or, or maybe you come from a really warm climate and you're acclimatized. All of those can cause, can limit, can change how you interact, how you uh, react to that cold, particularly your hands and feet. And that's a really big challenge. Uh, we you, To be fully functional, your hands, and you have a skin temperature of about 64 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, 18 C. Um, and uh, if you lower your skin temperature prior to the dive by handling like cold equipment without gloves on, then you're already setting yourself up as a deficit. Uh, you can get a non-freezing cold injury, which is basically nerve damage of your hands that cause that, or feet that cause them to get cold very quickly um, or overreact to cold and they shunt. Um, if your skin temperature is uh, kept at 54 degrees Fahrenheit for, uh, for about a week, um, and 46 degrees Fahrenheit for six hours or 43 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 minutes. That's how quickly that can happen. And again, that varies from person to person, but these are, that's why hands and feet are such a critical part of staying warm and dry gloves are a primary thing. Uh, so we really, we really, really push people to get dry gloves and use dry gloves. Preferably gloves are attached directly to the suit without a wrist seal in order so that you can improve your circulation to the hands and also make sure you keep from getting your boots too tight. You know, people are like, oh, I don't want air in my feet and therefore I want a tight boot. Don't do that because you uh, watch out for that because you need to make sure you have good circulation to your feet. Um, I wear uh, uh, medical exam gloves underneath my uh, dry gloves and then, um, and then put my insulation over it. And then I also wear plastic bags um, on my feet. Uh, and that also that is, acts as a vapor barrier and that will increase my effectiveness of my insulation. Uh, so that's also good. Active heating is great. Um, there aren't a lot of options that are right out there right now for hands and feet, but you know, hopefully that's something that is going to be changed, right, Jeff? Uh, sorry, I was, can you repeat okay. that? I was reading some of the comments at that moment. Okay. Any questions or comments about that? Um, well, yeah. There's there's a lot of stuff going on about um, about one electric undergarments being supported on the on the ship, or you know, is it easy to recharge, I assume, the batteries and stuff like that. It is. Recharging um, is easy on the ship. That's not a problem. Right. And then also just what are the temperatures they're expecting, stuff like that. Um, uh, well, you see here, that's what it says under under cold water equipment considerations, you're going to be using, you're going to be water as cold as negative, six, negative 2C, so about 28, 29 degrees. And right. uh, that is cold. Okay. And um, so a you need a warm undergarment and or a heated system, you know, uh, that's designed to work in that temperature. And again, what works for one person doesn't always work for the other. But, you know, I, I mean, I use a, a heated system, you know, especially for my hands. That's actually my biggest problem is my hands, um, as it is for a lot of people. Um, and, and if people aren't, if people want to talk specifically about, you know, maybe, hey, for me, I have to do this in this temperature. What does that mean for, 
temp you know temperatures that cold, I'd be happy to talk with them about it because it but it does vary from person to person a lot. Right. So the uh, so that's I mean that's good to know because that everyone needs to understand that everybody's different. For example, I don't get as cold as you know the person next to me that's diving because yeah. you know I'd like to say it's because I grew up in a cold environment and I'm used to it. Um, but it's just everyone's it's bodies are different. So yeah. So yeah, you're, you're not so, necessarily wrong. So <laughs> again, knowing what your preferences are, and just because an undergarment says it's good up to you know 30 degrees, doesn't mean Agreed. that same 30 degrees for this person as the next person. Correct. So, it, it's a ballpark. It's a place to start, and right. then we go from there. And that's why it's really important to prepare for trips like this by getting the equipment that you're going to use in Antarctica. Uh, you know, getting it way before the trip, getting a whole bunch of dives in that gear before you go anywhere and make it, and as much as possible, testing it in a, in a temperature as close as you can get to Antarctica. Now, it's probably not going to be possible to get, you know, to exactly that point, but you can get close. Okay. If you can get close, that'll help. Right. And that's with, with any sort of diving, whether it's exactly. recreational or technical, as soon as you switch out um, your common dive gear, you need to be prepared for the change differences. Exactly. Um, even just me changing from like the Duotherm 150 to a 300, I'm going to have a huge weight swing. So I need to exactly. know what, what kind of weights to bring and, and the suit will fit different and it will feel different underwater. So, Correct. so if you go up to the full thickness of a, like an XM 450 or, you know, the Polar Tech type undergarment, you're going to have all this extra stuff under the suit. Right. You need to be ready for that. And um, you don't want to practice on the spot because no, you want to no, go to the no trip practicing with new dive gear in Antarctica, right? You want to go there prepared exactly. so you can enjoy what you're there for. Exactly. You spent exactly. a lot of money to get there. So, yeah. So, so the, it, you know, and, and I started, it's funny my first point, bullet point here is a dry, dry suit. And that sounds funny. Of course you want a dry, dry suit. You'd be amazed at how many people come on a trip and it's a suit they've used forever and ever, but it had, had a problem beforehand and they, they maybe sent it out even to get repaired, uh, but they never tested it after it came back. And I'm like, no, 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 don't do that. Um, the other recommendation is to preferably have one that dries quickly. Uh, one, because it makes it a lot easier when you're packing it, but also it allows the suit to, to, uh, to uh, thaw out and to, um, and to dry overnight. Um, if you have a neoprene suit, uh, even a CF200, uh, it's going to stay wet, basically, and putting on a really ice cold, wet on the outside dry suit is not much fun. Okay, right. and you have the problem of evaporative cooling as well. So, so we really recommend the fabric suits like a TLS or, or a Flex Extreme kind of material. Um, you are going to need two full regulators, so that means uh, two first stages, two second stages, because you're putting the uh, system on an H valve. Uh, for those of you who dive doubles, it's basically set up like double tanks. So one regulator has uh, your BC inflator on it. The other one has the dry suit inflator on it, hose on it. Um, and one, one regulator has a pressure gauge or, you know, whatever your, your computer console is. Uh, when it comes to BCs and things like that, the number one priority is to get rid of plastic. Okay. Try to avoid plastic buckles, plastic uh, you know, quick snaps, you know, any of those kind of things, uh, because uh, plastic and cold do not go together very well. It becomes very brittle and it's very easy uh, because the gear is put in the middle of a Zodiac. It's, you know, it's very easy for somebody to accidentally step on it or drop something on it. And you don't want it to be hitting plastic that can break very easily. Um, the, the other thing, as far as preparation, we require at least 30 knives we prefer 50 dives, but the boat requires 30, uh, but at least 30 dives in, in the uh, equipment you're using. Okay, so the dry suit, the regulator, the BC, all that kind of stuff. Um, do not, please do not show up for one of our trips or for anybody's trip, because you shouldn't do this with pulling gear out of a package that you've never used before. Okay, uh, <laughs> you know, we've had uh, people do that and we've had to tell them, no, they're not using that, you know. Um, and uh, they're like, oh, it's so much better than my old, old one. I'm like, no, 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 you're going to use the old one, <laughs> okay, you know. Um, so, and, and obviously it sounds silly, but don't dive if you're not comfortable. There's some incredible, some people are just not cold water divers, no matter how much diving experience they have. But there's incredible snorkeling there. And so get the, have the dry suit and use the snorkel, go snorkeling, swim with penguins, swim with leopard seals, uh, uh, jump on an iceberg. I mean, it, you can have almost 
but you can have a very similar experience as the divers do, uh, just with, but without the gear, you know, all the gear. Right. So we're getting it's some questions about, experience. about the tank setup. Cause you mentioned the H valve. Um, so is, do you have a picture of that at all? I or don't, some, I'm sorry. Like... Um, the, um, I, it, it, basically it's a, um, it's two inlets, you know, on one, on one valve. So, uh, it's not two tanks. It's one tank with a, you know, one valve coming out of it, but there are two posts to you to screw the DIN valves in, the DIN regulators in. They do have to be DIN regulators. We require that. Um, uh, and, uh, mainly because it's a much safer system when the O-rings are cold. Um, and it fits better on, you know, when you have two of them in the back of you there. Um, right. So people and, have uh, to take steel cold tanks water. Are steel tanks. So they're very negative, uh, which is really nice. It helps a lot with the, with the, uh, with the uh, setup, uh, you know, with minimizing how much weight you need. Right. So, so basically you do need to have cold water diving equipment, which all Correct. goes all the way to not just your thermal insulation, but your regulator setup needs to be able to work in the cold environments. Exactly. And exactly. Din, DIN's an important thing to know because so many people have yoke. Exactly. Know. We produce a big expedition manual for everybody. And about a year before the trip, uh, we send that out to everybody so that people can, you know, start preparing about what it is to expect and what to have. And if they need to buy any equipment, what they need to get, things like that. You know, so hopefully that is helpful for people. Uh, so as it says here, you want to watch out for the regulator or the dry suit inflator freezing. So you want to make sure you have uh, two first stages with H valves. Uh, we, you don't breathe off the regulator, or I should say, uh, exhale through the regulator, um, or use practice with the inflator on the surface before you go in the water, because that's a very big way of having it freeze up. So uh, we do, those are things to watch out for. You do get some heat stress, believe it or not, you know, so that's a, definitely something to be aware of, and, and we watch for that. And we want you to watch for uh, camera for the cameras, you know, watching watching for fogging and things like that. So we have a setup outside uh, in the in the prep area for the divers, uh, where people can put you know work with their cameras and put their cameras there, uh, so that they can uh, stay at the acclimatized to the to the cold and won't have a problem with fogging when they get into the uh, into the ocean. Um, and as I said, they're unknown and dynamic dive sites. So this requires a diver who's self-sufficient, who has really, really good situational awareness um, and is comfortable with maybe not a lot of direction uh, beforehand just because they don't necessarily know what to expect. You know, this is part of ex exploring and part of expedition diving. Uh, we're going to talk about leopard seals in a minute. <laughs> right. Know? Yeah, that, that was a question about that. Yeah, um, we'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> I'm going to show you some. It's the best if I show you some pictures first. So yeah, that's, uh, always, that's always so been we, a question. You see that, yep. you know, because they're a big seal. So <laughs> yeah, they are. They're very impressive animals. So you, you guys ready to go underwater? Yes. All right. So so you can see this is a back row off a of zodiac. Pretty simple. They're very big military grade zodiacs with six people uh, per zodiac. So it's, there's quite a bit of space. Getting back up on the Zodiac is pretty much what you think it is. Uh, you're grabbing ropes uh, there and, and, and kicking, and then hopefully leveraging yourself in there that way. Um, if, you're, if you're my husband, you're doing it really well like this, you know? <laughs> yes, I am gonna show that video. Okay, that's what you're supposed to do. That look, He made it look pretty easy, right? You know? And I have a little bit more of a challenge. Um, First of all, what I'm, you know, I'm only 5'4", not 6'3". So, you know, when I, ex when I uh, extend my arms and lock my arms on those ropes, I'm still pretty much in the water, <laughs> you know. Um, and the other part is I have these uh, things called breasts, you know, that get in the way. So uh, let's take a look at how I do with, with it, you know. But, hey, I get in the water, I get back in, so. The hard part's getting the t my my uh, my breasts over the top, you know. But hey, but once I did, I get in. Okay, you know, I'm all right. There we go. That's me. <laughs> all right. And they're pretty good about those hands. The, the TLS comes in real handy, you know. That the telescoping torso and the TLS comes in handy for bringing me in. You know, very very helpful. But that's the hardest part of the whole thing. You know, falling in's a lot easier. You know, uh, and you know, you can see I, that's how. You know, then they take your fins off for you and you can see how, you know, delicate that is. But anyway, don't let that put it, if I can do it, anybody can do it. So what are you gonna see underwater? 
And this is what we all tend to really talk about. So this is these are some of the uh, the invertebrate life, a lot of siphonophores and, and salps that you often will see. A uh, lot of invertebrate things crawling. Uh, the the and Antarctica is a creepy, crawly place. Uh, you never see so many brittle stars in your entire life, or you know, like that crawling around the bottom. Uh, limpets, like this, all over the place. A lot of isopods and coapods. So these are are little critters like the, that would maybe you know take up the position of small crabs and things like that in other in other habitats. You see some of the uh, some of the krill and some of the isopods there on that glove. Pretty amazing, a lot of, lot of crustaceans. So it's a and tough choice of taking macro or, or wide angle shots? Um, well, it is a little bit of a challenge. I mean, the, the macro stuff is where I'm starting with, but uh, if you're really trying to pick one or the other, boy, yeah, I don't want to have to be that person that picks that, you know what I mean? Uh, you'll see why in a moment with the with the, back, with the wide angle. These are sea spiders. Uh, they're about a oh, good size, maybe about a half dollar size silver dollar size. These are actually what they call giant isopods and those are juveniles. Uh, and these are you know, smaller versions of them. Giant isopod, a big one. Uh, this is a small one. Uh, the giant isopods can be uh, up to the size of your fist like that one. Uh, and they are just ugly suckers, let me tell you. I mean, they are really ugly. Those of you who ever saw Wrath of Khan, a Star hmm. Trek Wrath of Khan, you remember that ant thing that drilled into Chekhov's ear yeah. you know, to take over his brain? That's what I always think about is when I see these guys. Is that, <laughs> that, um, massive sea stars. Um, this one's about three feet long and, and crawled almost as fast as I could swim. It was really crazy moving. Uh, sea anemones, you know, just like a lot of places. Uh, this is actually a, a juvenile ice fish. Uh, and the ice fish is a, uh, or um, uh, is called that because it actually has a, um, uh, when you call uh, uh, antifreeze in his blood, you know, so it actually can handle the uh, the winter and stay basically in a suspended animation. Uh, it's also called a dragonfish, and it comes in a whole pile of different colors. Pretty freaking amazing fish. That's about 18 inches long, those fish. But wow. there's also some great wide angle on the walls. You can see this, you can see that sea star there. Uh, you see the salps over there. Uh, and you see the visibility is quite good, right? You know, and uh, with quite a bit of um, invertebrate life, the kelp along the wall, and it's pretty impressive visibility as well. A lot of sponges. So it's a hard call because that's a pretty cool view. But you know, of course, all of us want to get penguins, uh, and this is a, this is an, an example of the penguins. You know, seeing the penguins right at the shoreline with your camera, you're in three feet of water, and you're just patient as anything, and hopefully you get a shot like that. Becky was very patient. <laughs> with a dry suit on, I assume. With a dry suit on, exactly. And even if you don't have a camera, you can always hang out with them on the surface, right? And that's, you know, that doesn't get old, hanging out with penguins. There is a rule that penguins can't get any closer than 15 feet to you, um, but, you know, uh, or you can't get any closer than 15 feet to them, excuse me. Uh, but they don't know about that rule, so they just kind of do whatever. Um, and it's pretty, if you come, I can come to the trip, I can pretty much guarantee that's going to happen to you. And they are very, very curious little suckers. The seals are also very curious, especially the little baby fur seals. Uh, they, you know, just like the sea lions, the baby sea lions, and the coronados. Okay, they're very, very similar to that in that they're very interactive. They want to play with you. They want to check you out um, and show how tough they are. Uh, the crab eater seals are often in large groups like that, and they are really cool to see. We also sometimes see Waddell seals. These are actually probably the rarest of the seals that we see. Uh, they're the deepest diving of the seals and uh, they're really impressive uh, animals. Uh, but we actually were very fortunate to have a great interaction with one in really shallow water. This is another one of those examples where it's really great to just bring your camera ashore. And uh, this is standing in three feet of water and just putting the video in the camera in the water. And this Waddell seal that was hanging out with all the little pieces of ice juvenile just swam over to check us out uh, and take a look at that. It was really funny. At first, all the non-divers were afraid the divers were going to scare away the, the Waddell seal. And I'm like, well, it doesn't look like he's too afraid of us, is, does he? 
you know, if anything, he want, he want, he's the one wanting to interact with us. We just stood there. So it's pretty neat. But he swam right up and was like, hello. Hmm. And of course, he's seeing himself in the dome port, which is pretty neat. It makes him very curious. So not bad. And you get an idea. That was just in three feet of water, so not a bad encounter. So you don't even need to be diving for that, obviously. Right. That's aw that's awesome. So leopard seals, though, are another game. I mean, you can see those in shallow water again as well, but we quite often also see them around ice. Now, leopard seals are the biggest, batter, baddest predator in Antarctica, with the exception of the orcas, and and these guys get big. Um, so uh, about four four meters to fourteen feet long, and up to um, 2,000 pounds. Uh, they are a big animal and uh, and they are to be respected for sure. Um, but they are hunting penguins. So just remember that, not hunting you. Uh, they're going after penguins and you don't look anything like a penguin, but they also really don't know what to really make of us because it's not like they see a bunch of divers, right? But you get an idea of the size of the head of that uh, animal. Uh, this one was really not sure what to do with our Zodiac. It didn't like us there. Uh, we did not go in the water uh, with that one for kind of obvious reasons. Um, we'll often sometimes get the penguins trying to escape the uh, leopard seals and they'll jump up on our Zodiac, which is kind of funny. But you have, to, you, have to let them, you have to push them back in. We can't take them ashore. So you see a leopard seal underwater and it's just an amazing experience. So this is like if I went and saw one of the like the walrus at uh, at Sea World. It's in that size range. Yeah, yeah, uh, not quite, but uh, uh, most of them are not that big. <laughs> this one, this one was not. This is actually probably a you know not a full grown adult uh, for, you know individual yet. Um, and you can see this one was very interested in my husband. Uh, and it, part of that is because he's disobeying all the rules, which is he's. Um, uh, he's by himself. He isn't with somebody else. He's up in the water column. Uh, and, uh, and he mainly did it to do to each kind of a reaction, uh, you know, to, to get the animal to try to figure out what he is. And by trying, and he does that by framing, using his mouth as a sizing tool. He's trying to figure out, okay, how big is this thing? And can I eat it? And the answer is reality is he can't. And he does know that. Um, but he's still trying to figure it out. <laughs> okay, so that was quite an encounter. Uh, this one actually is probably a little pissed off at the leopard seal that he sees in the dome port, um, uh, or she. He actually thinks it was a female, uh, but it gives you a good idea of view of the of those teeth. Okay, and we spent an hour and a half in the water with this particular leopard seal. She was playing with all of us, kind of checking all of us out. Uh, uh, when we were on the surface and underwater and um, around the iceberg that she was kind of calling home or hanging out on it. And, and uh, she was, th there was no real aggression. I mean, this is not aggression. She's actually, she's reacting to the, to what she's seeing probably in the dome port, but there was never any real threat felt by anybody. Uh, and like I said, she tolerated our presence for about an hour and a half. And she was an absolutely stunning animal. Yeah, it seems it seems animal. definitely like a lot more curiosity than anything. It, it is. It is. Now they move very differently, though. So so you know, if, if you look at their face and you look at the way they move, they look. It's almost a little reptilian. And so take a look at this video, and you get an idea, you know, as to what I mean by that. You can see their movement. You see how it, it, a little more serpentine looking the way they move? Mm -hmm. Yeah, really different. Um, and uh, this is actually a shot uh, that Becky took of the gentleman who was taking that video. So you can see just snorkeling, right? Not so bad, right? So the ice itself is just exciting to dive under and around. I mean, I love diving around the brash ice like that. Uh, you know, touching an iceberg and seeing where it, where it's grounded. I mean, it's pretty incredible feeling and, and to see to have. Um, and there's something. There's several rules about ice. One of them we already talked about is the importance of being aware of the ice and 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 your situational situational awareness around the ice, and making sure that you're conscious of where the ice is moving and if it's moving. And of course, it's a big reason you have those dive guides running the zodiacs is because they're watching the the ice and making sure the ice doesn't change direction maybe in the wind and drift back over divers. So that's obviously an important thing. 
But the other part is just, the, you know, ice never gets boring. I mean, just look at this, you know, it is fantastic stuff. It never gets boring. All different shapes and, and sizes and textures and even colors. So because of all the ice and, the, and some of the melting, is the salinity level lower? It is. Um, so quite, it's one of the challenges with ice is in that whole situational awareness thing is if you get close to a melting iceberg, then, and most, and they are melting, obviously, um, if you get close to a melting iceberg, it is actually, uh, you end up in a bra in fresh to brackish water, but you can't see it because it's the same temperature as the salt water. So you don't see a halo climb the same way. And, and it's a vertical climb, not a halo climb, not a, a horizontal one. So you get close to the iceberg and all of a sudden you're sinking. And then you, you put air in and, and then you maybe back away from the iceberg a little bit and all of a sudden you're floating to the surface. So your buoyancy control gets very interesting and it takes a little practice uh, to know, uh, okay, how far do I have to stay away from the iceberg so that I don't have that much of a, I don't have that kind of issue. Uh, so we try to avoid, we, we work with people on that the first time when they're diving in. Yeah, interesting. You see the caves there, a lot of nooks and crannies. Obviously, you don't want to go diving in an ice cave. Well, we actually went in that one really quick, but I don't recommend it. Let's avoid that part. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but as I said, icebergs are just amazing and nobody, nobody gets tired of icebergs. And that's true if you're on the surface too, because the other part about icebergs is icebergs turn everybody into a five-year-old. Everybody wants to climb on top of one, okay, and get their picture taken, conquer an iceberg, claim their iceberg, maybe take a nap on an iceberg, jump off their iceberg, okay, repeatedly jump off their iceberg. There's something you're gonna have, you're gonna have to do it, and I don't care how old you are, how young you are, how, you know, you know, stodgy you are about playing on ice. Yeah, it's, everybody's going to do it. It's a blast. And when you get to things like that and you see that and you see yourself in perspective to the, to the, the continent, you realize how small we really are and how much of it, how incredibly incredible this environment is, how important it is that we become advocates for this part of the world. And I guarantee that when you go there, uh, you then have a responsibility uh, to come back and be an ambassador uh, for this part of the world and represent it uh, to others like I'm hopefully doing today and encouraging people to have the, uh, engage in the right practices to minimize our impact on this environment. Uh, obviously global warming being the most significant of that right now. But ice never gets boring. So all these pictures show a calm sea. Is that uh, <laughs> is that most of it? Yeah, one, <laughs> uh, actually, once you get there, that usually is the case. So that's a good news. <laughs> um, but I want to thank our photographers for donating their images. They've been really generous uh, with sharing these images uh, so that we could share them with you. Uh, this was the group that we had on our last trip. Uh, that's actually Cape Fear in the background. Um, as we are getting ready to go around Cape Fear um, and uh, on our way home from our last trip in 2020. Uh, boy, it seems like a, kind of a lot's happened since then. Uh, but uh, it really is an incredible place. I hope you'll join us sometime. Uh, and just, and even if you don't, please remember the, the polar regions, uh, you know, it, when you talk about climate change and, and environmental issues, please remember that while this part of the world may look very inhospitable and in many ways it is, it's critical for us as a planet and it's critical that it be protected. And, uh, and I hope that you'll be a part of that effort. Yeah, that's Remember, 20 years from now, you're gonna be more disappointed by the things you didn't do than the things you did do. So I'm going to challenge all of you to go <laughs> off the beaten path and don't hesitate, uh, especially at places like this, because frankly, they're not going to be like that 20 years from now. And uh, that is the reality. Uh, so uh, th these are places to see sooner rather than later. Yeah, that's it's so, definitely uh, somewhere on to go. I apologize for running a little bit uh, long, uh, but I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have or, or chat some more about this. Uh, uh, as I said, this is my favorite topic, you know, being a polar diving and particularly Antarctica. So right. thank you very much. No, Faith, this is great. I'm, I'm glad you're able to come on and 
Um, I hope to have you back too on, on, and talk about some of your other destinations um, and some other stuff that you're working on because um, because this is great. Um, Thank you. And, you know, in the end, a lot of this, you know, I like doing these presentations because I like seeing what other people are doing because um, I want to eventually go there myself, probably, you know. <laughs> Um, so it's not I'd like, love to have you, Jack. come on now, we can do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I would love to go there just like, uh, last month, I, I, I'm pretty much going down the list of all the bucket dives locations where I want to go, <laughs> yep. um, and get introduced to them. So this is great. So I, I really appreciate it. Um, and again, I want to remind everybody that, uh, go ahead and post questions on, on the Facebook event or on the live video and we'll try and keep answering all those questions um and at any time i'm sure faith will take any questions that you you ask of her directly um, yep. um and you see this i have my email address up there if they want to send any questions or comments or you know anything i'd be happy to hear from people right so that's info at bluegreenexpeditions.com or expedition yep. no expedition sorry i just know it's a typo thank you oh it is expedition. yes Ex expeditions.com yep. um so yeah, I was gonna say I thought there was an S. Uh, no, you're right. Sorry, I just noticed that on my typo. I gotta fix that. <laughs> uh, so yeah, contact Faith about any of those trips. Um, she'll help you out with even under um, any of the thermal protection, like dry suits, dive gear, stuff like that. Um, any questions with that, or contact any of us at at DUI. We can also help you with that and get you started and pointed in the right direction. So again, thanks, Faith. I'm glad you're able Thank to come you. out and do this. Um, Awesome. So, Thank you very much, Jack. Yeah, so this is great. Um, so next month, something to look forward to. We are going to come back to San Diego. Um, not necessarily a bucket dive for me, but it is a dive location, uh, which is a common dive location for me, which is actually the um, Yukon wreck um, in San Diego. Um, we'll be interviewing or have a presentation by the person who wrote the Patty's Yukon Rec Dive Certification um, and get some photos and videos and different areas of going through that wreck. And I know Jeff has dove that wreck many and many times and he knows it like the back of his hand, right, Faith? Um, yeah, so, a few times. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, yeah, so this is what we are looking forward to next month. So, anyways, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out um, and we'll see you next month. Thank you. Yeah, bye.